<laughs> I'm, I'm glad to say it's time to teach now. Uh, it's a joy to come to you and to speak of the eternal verities, uh, truths that are immortal, truths that will never die. And in this special series of lessons, and I'm so glad to have you, bless you, uh, in this special series of lessons, we are, are dealing with what we call demons and deliverance, uh, the, the ministry of principalities and powers. Uh, this, this is a very uh, a large group of uh, cassettes, audio cassettes that are possible uh, to, to get that covers this whole massive subject. And, and it's, it's volume one, so be sure to ask for it by volume one. Uh, we have the, art, the, the video cassette in half inch and any make of machine that you might have uh, that you can see it in your own, own home. Uh, possibly above all, uh, we have the, uh, the, the teaching syllabus uh, that you can uh, follow me page by page. Today's lesson is on page 63, and we are dealing with a very intimate <coughs> lesson, how I learn exorcism, how I learn to cast out devils. And uh, uh, huh, it wasn't easy, and I didn't ask for it, and I didn't look for it. It was something that was thrust upon me. God solemnly warns all of mankind, you and me. First Corinthians 10 and 20 says, but I say that the things which the nations sacrifice, uh, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. God for refuses to permit his worshipers to have any fellowship of any kind whatsoever with the devil or with his angels or any of his works. And, and uh, you must stand right in there. You must believe it. And you, and you must accept it. I would not that you have fellowship uh, with devils. Uh, there's a pertinent truth in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 26. And they, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now, I, 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 this possibly refers to heathen nations, uh, that he may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Uh, through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we recover people, uh, cities, uh, nations from the snare of the devil. As you know, a snare is a trap. Uh, uh, it is a, is, it's a contraption that you set for a rabbit or a squirrel in order to catch them. The animal thinks it is finding good food to eat, and so going into the trap or the snare, it's caught, and so it is a deception. Uh, this is the manner in which the devil deceives the whole world, the, the, the heathen nations, and even some people in Christian lands. It's by a snare. They think it's one thing, and they get themselves involved in another. The devil fools people into believing that they will have pleasure in serving him and doing his things, but they do not get the pleasure. They are deceived. Uh, he fools them into believing that if they follow him, that everything will be all right. And then when nothing is right, and they have heaps of problems, just like most heathen nations do, uh, then they don't know what to do. The scripture says that he takes them captive at his own will. Would you like to read that again in 2 Timothy 2 and 26? It, it says, uh, it, it says, but I say that the things which the nation sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye have fellowship with devils. And then he says in 2 Timothy 2 and 26, and that ye may recover themselves from the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. <laughs> that, that, is, that is mighty strong. Been taken captive by him at his own will. Can you imagine that? That he does as he pleases. That that statement indicates that the devil willfully and deliberately sets snares in order that he might capture human persons, in order that he might enslave them. Now, though I was reared in a Christian environment and in a, in a Christian, in an evangelical church, and, and grew up from a baby uh, in, in, in that church, I can never remember in my total youth of ever hearing a whole entire sermon uh, relative to what I'm going to teach you right today on, on, on demon power. Now, he was mentioned. You know, he was mentioned. He was normally called Slewfoot, you know, or, or something like that. And, and that everybody laughed. 
And then they would say, now you, you devil, you go back to hell where you came from. Uh, and he hasn't been there yet. Uh, that is his final destination. He is today the prince and the power of the air. And so I never got in on this at all. I, I just grew up. We, we heard beautiful gospel, wonderful gospel, but we, we knew nothing about the battle. I look back now and, and see churches split. I look back now and see some of our members that went to insane asylums. I, I look back and I say, whoo, think of the ignorance that I grew up in and didn't know I was ignorant, you know. I thought I was fully informed. I thought that I was getting a tremendous education from the whole of the Bible. But then I found out there's an area of the Word that I actually knew nothing about, and neither did my peers, because they taught me uh, nothing. I never read a book that was done passed around in our congregation. And, I, and I, I never heard a sermon on how you can defend yourself from the devil, how you can curse the devil, how you can cast him out, how you are, have priorities over him, that he will flee when you say, go, and you resist him. I, I did not know about this. When I went into the ministry, we have stories in the Bible of Jesus casting out the devil. I followed uh, the, you know, the pastors that I'd heard, and I spiritualized. I said, now, in, in this great realm of sin, uh, you know, uh, leprosy is a type of sin in, in, in general, and, and, and palsy is a type of the helplessness of sin. You just shake and you shake. And, 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 and demon possession, it's a type of the fury of sin. Oh, fury of sin, it's a bad. And that's all I... I, I, that's what I preached, you know. It was a type. Demon possession is no type of anything. It's the real thing. It's being possessed of a real personality called the devil and, and with some of his uh, uh, demons that work with him and for him. Well, I got along all right. I preached for three years here in the United States, and then I began my missionary work. Now, I got all right, along all right in New Zealand, Australia, you know, but then I, I got to Indonesia. Now, I didn't ask for anything. I, I just wanted to keep it this, this pleasing, happy little way. Get up and give a nice little talk on the prodigal son. Uh, Daniel in the lands didn't give an invitation. Get people saved and go home happy. That's all I expected. In a meeting there in Indonesia, it was a large building, uh, similar to this building here. It had a large altar, just about like the one here. And on the front seat was a girl in the beginning of the service, she got off the seat, and it was a wide place, just very similar to this one here. And she began to, uh, 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 to gyrate like a serpent and go from one side over to the other side. I mean, I mean a long way, 50 or 60 feet, you know. And did you know nobody noticed it? The song leaders sung looking up, you know. And when they prayed, they looked up. But no, and I couldn't get my eyes off this little girl. Green foam was coming out of her mouth, clear out here, looked like six or eight inches, covering her all through this part of her body. Her eyes dancing, serpent eyes, terrible. I, I just, you know, cringed sitting on the platform. I, I, inside, I said, now, the pastor will take care of this in a hurry. I'm waiting for one of the, 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 the uh, ushers to walk down and pick her up. Did you know this went on for 50 or 55 minutes and nobody did anything? And she just went from one side to the other, just like a snake. And then she'd turn over the other way. She kept her head toward the platform, grinning at the people, mocking the people on the platform. And here she came back. Now, Java, uh, Indonesia, is a place where there is, of a truth, a lot of demon power. But now, this was my first time. <laughs> my first time. Now, brother, the first time can be the hard time, you know? And I said, oh, God, save souls. And the Lord spoke back to me and said, I can't save souls until you move this down here. I said, oh, Lord, move that girl. The Lord said, no, that's your job. Oh, I said, no, no. Oh, Lord, move that girl. And the Lord said, no, that's your job. Whew. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I'm glad they had a long song service and, and, and a long prayer time and a long Bible reading and, and, and so forth because I was sitting back there battling. Here were, say, 1,500 people uh, present, and here was a little girl under the power of the devil. The pastor did nothing. The ushers did nothing. And here she was uh, going up and down with green mess coming out of her mouth. And nobody watching her, even the people she passed by, didn't even look down. So I guess she had done it before. But they didn't take her out. And this was a beautiful church. I mean, this wasn't a poor place. This was a magnificent place of worship. 
Well, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> so uh, I got up from my chair away in the back and I, I, I started toward the platform, <laughs> toward the pulpit. And my interpreter was right there by me. I'd never been in this place before. It was my first night. And I'd been in the country over a week. And I, I, for my insides, I didn't think it out with my head. For my insides, I said, get up from there. It, it so astounded my interpreter, he didn't say a word. He just closed up, never said a word. And uh, the, the little thing, they blinked an eye, reached and took her arm, wiped that green mess off her face, uh, stood up, backed up, and sat down in the seat. And like a mummy, not like a human, but like a mummy, glared at me, glared at me uh, for the next 50 or 60 minutes as I preached. And, and uh, you could feel a stillness all over that place. Nobody had ever rebuked like that. Of course, most of the people didn't understand English, but that devil did. That girl didn't speak one word of English, but that devil knew that I meant get up from there. And, and, and I, it wasn't premeditated, and I didn't know I could do it. I just knew that to save that meeting, and I wanted to see a few hundred people saved, that I had to get that thing off the floor. So when I got through preaching, my interpreter went ahead and interpreted for me. And I got to the end of my sermon. Rather than giving my altar call, I leaned over and I said, Come out of her! <laughs> You'd think it was an earthquake that shook the building. The power of God hit that girl. She was sitting there like a mummy, you know, and not an eye moving, not a muscle moving for all that time that I spoke as if she was hypnotized. And when I said, Come out of her, suddenly she became normal. Her eyes, her face, her body. And she looked around, and, 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 and she was smiling. And she spoke to the one next to her. And I said to the interpreter, I said, what, what, what is she saying? And, and the interpreter said, what did she say? And he says, uh, she said, where am I? She didn't even know where she was. She was so under the power of the devil, she didn't know she was in church. But I want to tell you one thing. I did not have to give an altar call. The glory of God came down on that place. The Spirit of the Lord hit that place. And hundreds from all over came rushing to that altar and gave their hearts to Jesus. Now, I didn't know what it was. So I went home. I was traveling with a man named Howard Carter from London, England. He is a theologian and the president of a Bible college. And I explained it to him. And I said, hey, you may not want to travel with me anymore. Huh. I tell you. <laughs> uh, and I told him what happened. I said, it's pretty bloody. And I said, uh, uh, to tell you the truth, the pastor didn't speak to me after church. Might have been one of his kids or his friend's kids. I don't know. But I said, I'll tell you one thing. People got saved. So he sat there. He was a thinking type. And, and he, would, he, he, would, he, he sat there and, and uh, wiped his face a little while holding his hand like this. And, and he said, it sounds all right to me. Well, I said, well, well thank you. Uh, he says, it may never happen again or it may happen some more. Uh, but said, it's all right with me. He uh, says, I, I, I don't see anything wrong with it. Maybe it'll happen when I'm around sometime. He was a teacher, not an evangelist. And so, and, it, and at that night, he was teaching in another place. The, the need was so great until we, we were not in the same meetings very often. And so I said, well, uh, that's an oriental disease uh, that, <laughs> that I'm glad I'm taking care of, that there won't ever be anymore, and I won't ever see it anymore. But I began to, to, to look into the Bible and to read the incidents where Jesus cast out devils. And I said, oh, oh. Maybe something like this is in the Bible. I didn't know. I didn't know the Bible was full of it all the way through it. I didn't realize that. And so uh, about the next week, we were in another city. We only spent a night or two in each city uh, because we were only three months in Indonesia, and we had to cover a lot of territory. And we were in another city, and again, he was in one, one, he was in one church, and I was in another, at least in auditoriums, uh, in order to take care of the ministry uh, that was before us. And I had an interpreter again, and uh, we got to this church late, and it was a big place, packed full of people. Even the aisle had folding chairs down the aisle and people sitting in them. And we had to walk kind of sideways down the aisle. You know, there were so many people you couldn't walk straight uh, because they had these extra chairs in the aisle. I got about a third of the way down. My interpreter was in front, and a woman uh, grabbed me by my coat like a vice. I went to shake free, but she wouldn't turn loose. She just looked up at me and grinned, and she wouldn't turn loose. And my interpreter walked right off and left me, went clear to the platform all, all by himself, and looked back and said, come on. Well, how could I come? I couldn't go anywhere. I, uh, you know, they were holding my coat. And I, I, I leaned over to see what the woman wanted, 
and she spoke to me in English. Uh, she said, you, you have a black angel in you, and I have a white angel in me. <laughs> Who? Now, I didn't know exactly what to do. I could have slapped her side of the head, but, but you, know, you know, being a guest and a visitor, that wouldn't be too nice. I, I, I could have rebuked her and said, turn me loose, and I could have, like Joseph, given her my coat and walked on up there without a coat. But when I leaned over and I saw the devil in her, I just dropped my briefcase that had my Bible in it. I put my hands on both sides of her head. And I said, you lying spirit who, who says that I have a, a black spirit in me and that this woman has an evil spirit, a white spirit in her, you're a liar. I said, come out of her. And you know, instantly, God set her free. You can tell when people are free. Their eyes clear up. Their face clears up. Their tensions go. Their wildness leaves their body. You know? <laughs> the, the, the church stopped singing. You know, they were singing. When they heard this American roaring away, come out of her, they, they stopped to see what the American was doing that was supposed to be a guest that night. And just a, a one-night a one night, a one night service. And I spoke to her and I said, when, when did you get like this? She said, 15 years ago, I went to a witch doctor. And, and I've had this... I says, it's never done what it did tonight before. This was new. But says, it's doing something or another all the time. And I, I'm so weary of it. And so she says, I'm free. And I know I'm free. And I am free. And she was wonderfully set free from that night. Well, when we got back to the room where we were staying, I told Mr. Howard Carter from London, England. I said, sir, another one happened. And it's worse than the first one. And told him how before I got into the platform, when I was only a third of the way down the aisle, I was accosted by this woman and, and how I cast that thing out of her and she was set free. He said, well, what happened? He said, well, they, they gave me the pulpit early. I preached and many, many, many people came and found Jesus as their savior. Well, he said, now when people are finding Jesus, it, it touches me very, very, and it says, it shows me there's something right going on. It says, I haven't seen anybody act like this. Uh, but it says sometime it'll happen when I'm around and I'll, I'll test the spirits. Uh, but he says it sounds all right to me. I didn't know what it was. I, I was a young man learning how. Isn't this something that a young man has to learn by experience? There's nobody to teach him. Aren't you glad you have a teacher that can tell you these things and take the word of God and open these things up to you so that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free? Ah. If I were to tell you all the instances, uh, just, just in this one area, in, 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 the, in the island of Java, it would take two or three lessons uh, to go through them, because there are many of them. And, and God did, we never failed. God set them free every time. And it rejoiced our hearts to see the power of God liberate people and set them free and make them to be happy in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it was a joy uh, to, to learn in this way. And now God says me not only to learn, uh, he tells me to share. And my job is to share with you uh, these things of the Lord. And maybe I should tell you uh, a, few, a few more of them there, but some of the things that I learned uh, from this was that as we ministered through this island of Java, I discovered that through the numerous encounters we had with the devil, that the things we learned uh, were also most interesting and exciting. But the greatest thing that I learned uh, was that there was a conflict that if I went into a heathen place and to bring out a lot of souls, I had a conflict with the devil. And I better know it. I better find it out. Or I couldn't win all these souls to the Lord Jesus. So I learned personally that there was a conflict. And then something within me uh, said that Christ was stronger and greater than any of these forces and that I had complete power to, to set those people free. I hadn't been taught this. This had to come out of my own spirit. That it was not a person that I, that I, or that I met uh, who caused the battle. It was a spirit that caused the battle. It was something uh, within that person that caused them to want to fight me and, uh, and, to, and to come against me. It wasn't me personally. It wasn't because I was an American. It wasn't because I was a white person. It was because the devil immediately thrust himself against me. And so he opened up the battle. Maybe I shouldn't have waited for him to open the battle. I should have opened the battle on him. I discovered that there was no reason for me to fear. 
Now see, early discoveries are interesting. Nobody taught me this. I, had, I, I learned it this way, that, that I could not lose a battle, that it was not possible to lose a battle. I found that though, though they would scream and tear themselves, and they, would, uh, uh, they could not it hardly touch me, and then they could not harm me. I never did get harmed by any, I never got beaten or hit. I, I've had them to double up their fist or something other than I just say, in Jesus' name, stop. And, and, and took control of it, and that I was perfectly safe in exercising evil spirits out of other people. I found that in most cases that the demons wanted to run away when they discovered my presence was there. And they did not want to confront me. <laughs> and so it was not that they were belligerent and, and wanted, wanted to fight me. They did not. They wanted to run away from me. So once I sought to confirm uh, this new activity with the Word of God, then the, one of the first things that came to me was the great commission that Jesus gave. And this became the Gibraltar of my faith then in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 17. And th this became a Gibraltar of my faith. It became the anchor. I said, say here, hey, look at here. This is what God can do, and I know, and I know that he can, that he can do it, you see. Now, we went on through the, the Orient, and uh, we discovered many things. Uh, in China, we, we had these conditions where we had to cast out spirits out of people that would tear them, and, and, and they couldn't sit anywhere and couldn't go anywhere. In Japan, uh, we, we had the same thing happen, and I... Brother, I was 20 and 21 years old. <laughs> I said, this is an oriental disease. Man, I'd be glad to get out of it. So when we crossed Siberia and Russia into Poland and, and, and into Europe, I said, I'm, I'm glad to get away from that, that nagging thing that almost every meeting I have, somebody snarls up and I have to cast the devil out of them. I'd be glad to get away from it. We hadn't been in Poland uh, a week, I don't believe. It, the most could have been 10 days. Before, we, I, we were speaking in a large church, and I don't know where Reverend Carter was there or not. Uh, it seems to me that he wasn't in that meeting because we had so many separate meetings, just two men traveling together, and the needs were so great, we could use 40 men in some of them rather than just two. But in the meeting that I had, I think it was in the great city of Lodz in Poland, uh, that uh, uh, the meeting opened, and, I, and I, I was sitting on the platform, and, and a woman on the front seat began to say, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah, hallelujah. And I said, oh, boy, that's terrible. <laughs> that's cutting, destroying, you know. And I, I said, ah, oh, you got to get rid of that. Did you know, for the whole preliminaries, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes, however long the thing was, she sat there and about every minute said, hallelujah, hallelujah. And her face didn't even look right. Did you know the pastor did nothing? That's what amazes me in religious leaders. Uh, the, 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 the ushers did nothing. The deacons did nothing. She sat there and disturbed that meeting for almost an hour before I got up to speak with a little, hallelujah, hallelujah. Whew. Now, all I did is pray for souls. I am a soul winner. I said, oh, God, save souls, save. The Lord says, I can't because of that annoyance on the front seat, getting all the attention. I said, oh, Lord, uh, help that woman. God says, I can't help her. So she won't let me help her. I said, Lord, you do something. The Lord said, you're going to have to do it. Ho, ho, ho. Are you sure? <laughs> when I got up to speak, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I never pre-thought pre these things out. I walked up to that pulpit, and, 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 rather, and rather than just uh, 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 saying good evening, it's a great joy to be here, glad to see you, glad to be in your city, I, I just said, you shut up! <laughs> and a strong, loud voice. You say, did she shut up? No. She began to bark like a dog. She barked like a dog. A beautiful woman. And, and then here came the ushers, you know, you know, goodness gracious. I said, go back and sit down and told my interpreter to start talking. And so I leaned over and I said, you come out of her. And I never did get close to the woman. She was healed by God's power. That barking stopped. The hallelujah stopped. And, and she was completely free, healed by God's mighty power. The spirit of the Lord came upon that mighty audience and hundreds of people found Jesus that night. Now, that's my education, my education, you see. But <laughs> I got started. I said, say, they got, they got this in Europe, hadn't they? It's not only in China, Indonesia, and Japan, in Europe. Did you know in England we had many cases of people that were possessed to be set free? 
But in my foolishness, I said, I want to get back to America. You Europeans, you got it, and you, and you Asians, you have it, but I'm going back to America where we don't have it. And you know, when I got back to America, within the first two weeks that I was here, I had a tremendous uh, confrontation that I'm going to tell you about in our next lesson. It's beautiful to meet together for the sublime purposes of understanding the revealed will of God pertaining to the Holy Scriptures, and that's the purpose of this class. And uh, we, we greet also uh, those extended from us uh, out in the great world of television, uh, cablevision, and satellite operations uh, where uh, several million others will be joining with us and learning of these things together. We, we really say thank God for the honor of teaching the Word of the Lord. We've come to a primary lesson. Uh, very important is, is this lesson. It's how I personally learned exorcism of demons. H how did I learn it? How did I know about it, you know? How could I do it? I, I grew up in a, in a full gospel atmosphere and, uh, and, and heard and listened uh, about, about the gospel, but not one time did I ever hear a full message on who the devil was, how we could defeat him, and how he maneuvers himself to destroy. We prayed for the sick, but if you lost your mind, we put you in the, in the asylum uh, because we, we were not taught that the devil uh, was, uh, you know, uh, doing these things and that you should be set free. And so we had to learn uh, through our experiences on the mission field. We did not learn it in this country. We learned it in traveling overseas. And something was in our backbone that was good, I suppose. We wouldn't back up. And we wouldn't back down. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't have fear. When there came up a situation, we were willing to deal with it. So uh, I, I'm, possibly we should, you know, let you know that, uh, that uh, pussyfooting around wouldn't have got the job done. Or if you'd have been fearful and ran, uh, the natives would have laughed at you. But when you stood up to the devil and cast him out, it made God a hero. And you better believe it. Now, in our previous lesson, we showed you how throughout the Orient and throughout Europe, uh, we discovered people uh, that were possessed. And we told you that when we came back to the United States, uh, we, we again uh, discovered this thing. And, and we will go into that in, in just a moment. Now, what I really want you to realize is that we're living in the last days and that we are, we are going to see millions of people who need a special deliverance from the power of the devil. And that God needs a mighty army of men and women and young people who will combat evil spirits and set people free in the United States of America and all of the other lands and all the other countries. Every day, uh, there are letters coming to our office of people that want to be free. Every day, telephone calls from all over, not only all over this nation, but from other nations of the world, crying out for a prayer of deliverance. A prayer of deliverance. This very week, right now, I, I will be flying uh, uh, about 1,000 miles one way and 1,000 miles back to set a man free. And he happens to be a minister of the gospel that needs to be set free and, and has been urging it for several weeks until finally I, I said, I'm going to go and lay my hands upon that man and set him free in Jesus' name. What you need to know is this, the psychiatry cannot heal you and set you free because it deals with the mind and we're not talking about mind. We're talking about an evil spirit that's indwelling a human person that needs to be cast out of that person. Philosophy cannot deliver you and set you free because philosophy may have ideal teachings, it may have truthful teachings, but it has no strength and the power of exorcism to set the immortal soul free from the powers of the devil. Pastoral counseling cannot set you free. You cannot talk the devil out of a person. You cast him out, just as Jesus did, just as Peter did, just as Paul did, just as the mighty men of the centuries have done. That is the only, you can't counsel him out. Uh, uh, and, and many churches in America today, they have professional counselors uh, that they sit and listen all day long to a bunch of stuff. And, and when they get through this, say, a little weak prayer over them, say, God bless you now, I do understand your need. And that is not what the world needs. The world needs deliverance by the mighty hand of God, and God wants you to be a help in that. I'm sure that he does. God's power is available 
to anyone and to everyone. God is no respecter of persons. God will bless you. God will bless you and whoever you are. God will bless you. Now, that the thrust of what we wish to bring to you is found in the Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. It says, Rejoice heavens and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. The devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Uh, this scripture reveals uh, that there will be a greater, more dreadful manifestation of the devil on this earth than there has been previously. That in the ultimate days of this dispensation, uh, that there will be manifestations of evil and of the devil such as you have never seen before. Uh, if you have a little pencil there, you could draw a little circle around the words, great wrath. The devil is angry. Now, we must stand up against him. <laughs> Let him get angry. That's all right. Sure. And he says, the reason for it, he has but a short time. Soon he's going to be in, in, incarcerated. Soon he's going to be put into the bottomless pit. Soon he's going to be put away. He is angry about it. He's like a dying snake, flapping his tail this way and that way. Well, that don't make any difference. Command him, and he must obey. We're still, we're still the, the elect of the Lord that we might set men and women free. Now, in the Revelation chapter 16, uh, verses 12 to 16, it says there are three unclean spirits which possess one called the dragon, which is Satan himself, and the beast, and also the false prophet, a trinity of hell. And God says that these spirits uh, of devils working miracles will go forth to deceive the whole world and will ultimately bring them to the battle of Armageddon. Can you imagine that the great battle of Armageddon is going to be come about for the simple reason that devils go out and deceive nations and bring them there? They won't come because of logic. They won't come because of intelligence. They will come because of deceptions. They will be deceived into coming there. It is an amazing truth, and it's in the Bible. It's in your Bible. It's in all of our Bibles. God help us to read the Bible, to know the Bible, and to accept it in Jesus' name. Now, in the Revelation chapter 9, at verses 1 through 11, it's a long reading. We read that out of the bottomless pit there come swarms of evil creatures to torment mankind. And you say, that scares me. Well, honey, you better lose, lose your scary and lose your fear because we're facing times when God needs brave men and brave women to get a job done for him. Come out of your shell. Ask God for his strength and his power and his authority to set people free. When the Bible says this is going to be, it's going to be. And, and so get ready for it. Don't, don't flinch and don't give up and don't quit. He says there will be swarms of evil spirits that will come up to torment mankind. It seems to me that the greatest need in the spiritual world for men and for women today is to understand how to control and cast out devils. One of the greatest needs in the world. The church has tried to taboo the ministry of exercising spirits. Ministers have tried to turn their backs on the situation and, and, uh, and have mentally ill people committed to insane asylums in order to forget them and not set them free. And yet there is an ever-growing need in our land and in all the lands of the world for a ministry of setting human beings free from the devil's power. And it's God's moment to gloriously, wonderfully, blessedly set them free. The Lord has spoken to me and indicated that in the future, uh, those that lead his army must by all means pray not only for the sick, but they must reach out into the world of spirit and set men free from the powers of the devil, breaking the chains of hell and setting men free in their, in their solical parts of their mind, their emotions, their will, and their bodies. In our modern world of tomorrow, uh, there will be millions, now God has told me this, who need to be set free. God is looking for men and women with courage and compassion to set humanity free. The Great Commission must come into dynamic force. We must obey the words of Christ and set men free. The Lord Jesus said, they that have faith shall cast out devils. You've got to have faith. You've got to, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We must read that word until we believe it. We must do this without fear, without compromise, without doubts. We must do this with the same great love that Jesus had, the same great compassion that Jesus had toward those who lived in his time. We must destroy the works of the devil. Now, if you will, if you will let Jesus do that, in, in your own heart and in your own life, I, I tell you, you can be a, an awfully big asset under the kingdom of God. I told you in our last lesson that in the coming lesson, I'd show you how I discovered this thing in the United States. 
is my three years as an evangelist in this country and my 17 years of living in this land, I had not come up against demon power that I knew anything about. But when I came back from off the mission field, I was visiting my brother in the St. Louis area. And over in Alton, I was preaching around in various churches, having just come back from around the world, and everybody wanted to hear me speak and so forth. And so I was in this church for a Sunday. And after we had lunch, the pastor said, would you go with me to pray for one of our people? Well, I didn't really want to. But, you know, when a pastor asks you to, you, you say, well, all right, I'll go along with you, I suppose. And so we went over to one of the houses, just a very common little house with a porch on it, a swing on it, and, and a typical southern type of home. And, and the pastor uh, started to go into the door first, and uh, just as he opened the door, uh, he, he let me go in first. Inside the house, I saw a young man. He looked from 21 to 25, something like that, years of age. He was seated in a chair, and kneeling beside him was his mother. She was crying, speak to me, son, speak to me, son. Speak to me. And, 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 and I looked, and I saw a strange little grin running down the sides of his face. And I said, that's the same thing I saw in the Orient. That's the same thing I saw all through Europe. I, 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 I know, I know you're a demon spirit. Now, you see, what had happened to that young man? For somewhere between three and six months before, uh, this young man had slipped away, although he was in his middle 20s, he had a right to go. Uh, he slipped away to a, a spiritist meeting to a seance. Now, he can't remember what happened there. There was nobody to tell, and so the parents did not know what happened. They only know they found him lying on the front porch the next morning. His shirt was gone, his back was bruised and bleeding, and they found that he was a paralytic. Well, a strange thing. Uh, he couldn't walk, but if you were to lead him, push him forward, he could walk. If you put one leg in the air, he'd leave it there for a day, you know, or two days. He didn't seem to get weary. Just leave it hanging there. You had to put it back down. Put his arm in the air, he'd leave it there until you moved it. Anywhere you put him, he'd stay that way until you moved him again. Uh, it was a strange situation. He, he, he could hear because if they clapped their hands, he would see what it was. But he couldn't speak. And so for all these months, he had not said one word out of his mouth. He could eat, he could sleep, but he, he couldn't control himself. Uh, if, uh, well, to eat, you had to feed him. He couldn't pick up anything. Uh, uh, you had to feed him. Uh, his hands were, were just like a, um, uh, some kind of automatum, you know? Uh, um, just, you just put it in the way you wanted to, and it would stay there. But he couldn't of his own self pick up anything and feed himself. He couldn't put on his clothes. Uh, he was hopeless and had been this way for a number of months. I didn't know this. The pastor didn't tell me what it was. I don't know that he knew much about it. And, and so uh, when I walked in that room and, and I heard this mother pleading, oh, speak to me, speak to me, speak to me. <laughs> and I saw that silly grin. I jumped across that room like a panther and I grabbed the sides of his head and I said, come out of him. And I said, you speak to your mother right now. And the spirit of the Lord came upon me and the spirit of the Lord, I came upon him and, and, and he turned to his mother and said, Mother, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. Forgive me. At that moment, his hands were loosed. His feet were loosed. He could stand up. Uh, he could walk. He could talk. He rejoiced. He said, I'm so glad. And he told how he had been at a spiritist meeting against the wishes of his mother, who was full of gospel, at a spiritist meeting. And he doesn't know what happened. It went into some kind of a, uh, of a, of a, a seance of some kind. And, and he went into some kind of a coma, and they threw him off on the front porch uh, unconscious, and he couldn't get around on his own. And it took a man of God to come and to set him free. First, you had to know what it was. The pastor had gone there and pat him on the hand and said, I'm praying for you, praying for you now. <laughs> you don't pray for stuff like that. You cast it out. Jesus didn't pray for the demon possessed. He said, come out, you see. And, and so we have to follow Jesus if we're going to get any kind of uh, victories. And so I said, hey, I have found it. And so from that time, we found many interesting and exciting things in the United States. I was in Indianapolis, Indiana. I went to pray for a lady that called for prayer and I got over there and I couldn't pray. I can't tell you the whole story, you know, like, like I'd like to. And, and, and I couldn't pray. I tried to pray. So I got up and walked around the room and over on a table, I found a whole stack of magazines by this black man that used to be in New York City named Father Divine, who claimed that he was God and that he was God. 
and, and come to find out this daughter, who was a public school teacher, had been back there living with Father Divine. And, and, and she told me, she says, uh, one moment you look at the table and it was empty and, and Father would pray. And when Father got through praying, the whole table was loaded with pork chops. She says, where do you suppose they came from? It was to think that a high school teacher would talk so stupid. I said, they came from a hog. That's where all pork chops come from. And I said, you are messing with a familiar spirit. Because she told me, we don't have to write our telephone. We communicate in our spirits. I talk to him every day. He talks to me every day. She had communicated with the devil and had brought the thing home. Her mother was sick, almost under death. And they asked me to pray for her, and I couldn't pray. And so when I found this out, I said, I'll pray on one, con on, on one condition, that you get rid of this sorcery in this house and stop worshiping the devil and will worship God. Now, now, these were full gospel people again, you know. The mother was, I don't know about the daughter. Uh, but here was a high school teacher uh, teaching in our state uh, that was playing with magic and playing with, uh, uh, with, with, with demon power. And, and she broke down a little and said, well, I'm sorry, and I won't do it no more, and I promise all of that. And I prayed for her mother and left. But you see, I was getting acquainted that this thing was in our country, and it was something that we have to deal with in our country, and that if we don't deal with it, it can be an overwhelming uh, situation. Now, there are pastors and, and religious leaders that will say, why don't you just leave that type of thing alone? Let's be nice about, about Christianity and have it with beautiful plush seats and nice carpet and nice drapes. And can't you just leave out that awful part? Well, you have to go back to Jesus. Uh, uh, Jesus set many people free from demon power. And if you're going to be like Jesus, you have to set the captives free. And now, and it doesn't matter what you want. The devil's having what he wants. <laughs> He's having a heyday. And so you're going to have to make up your mind that you're either going to fight or you're going to be defeated. Now listen, the great denominational churches of this country are losing millions of members. Now you know that's true. They're losing millions of members right now. And the reason for it, they haven't stood up against the powers of darkness that's on television, uh, that's in pornographic literature, uh, that's in lesbianism, and, and uh, all, all kinds of, uh, of, of illicit sex. Uh, and uh, they, they haven't stood up against it, and, and they, they haven't spoken against it, and they haven't set people free. And, and they are in a decline, and they need the power of God before they'll ever go the other direction. They need the power of God. Now, I have discovered that God can do more in a minute, you know, <laughs> for the kingdom than, than we can in, a, in 50 years, in a whole lifetime of ministry, in a minute. Now, we saw this in the Philippines. Uh, you've heard the story of the girl named Clarita Villanueva, that she was bitten by the devils in Bilibid prison. Uh, we have that in a special cassette that you can order. And also the Invisible Boy. It's in a lovely cassette, similar to this one right here. And you can get the whole story. It takes about an hour, and, and so you can't get it in a little lesson like this, but you can get the whole story of this girl and the Invisible Boy. But she was being bitten by this spirit, and it was destroying her. It was killing her. And it went on for three weeks in the city jail or Billy Bid prison, and I wasn't aware of it. I was so busy building a building <laughs> and, and getting the thing going until I wasn't even reading the newspapers. And you know, neighbors, uh, we that are Christians can get so busy with God's work until our neighbors can go to hell. You just got to be careful, you know, uh, that, that you that you keep your eyes open and your heart open to bless your neighbors and friends and to do your part in getting people to go to heaven. But anyway, I heard this on the radio in, in the Philippines one night after the news, after 10 o'clock. And when I heard the little girl scream, they're killing me, they're killing me, they're killing me. And, and I heard the doctors in confusion. A, a, a radio man just stepped in there with a mic and got this whole thing, took it out and put it on the air. 45 minutes of it. You've never heard anything like it in your life. It was, it was simply dreadful beyond anything you've ever heard. As, as she screamed, and they yell, yeah, teeth marks, teeth marks. Yeah, look how deep they are. And look, she's kicking, and she knocked this one down. She hit that one, and oh, it, it, was, it was a massacre. It was so bad. I was so disturbed, I went and laid down on the front room floor in my house and cried all night that the devil was so hurting a person 
that, that it was so bad, it was so terrible, I just prayed all night for God to set the girl free. The next morning as I began to shower and, and go down to my building site where we were building the new church, the Lord spoke to me and said, go pray for that girl in jail. And I said, no, <laughs> get somebody else. I stayed up all night. And, and the Lord says, no, says, uh, you, you go pray for her. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm not a jail preacher. I'm not going. He says, I'm building a church here, and I don't want to get it messed up with anything like that. I'm not going. And after I'd showered and dressed and was ready to get in the car, I couldn't get in the car. I was right by it. But the Lord spoke to me very strong and said, if you don't go, she'll die. Well, I said, get somebody else then. The Lord said, and this broke my heart more than I never had my heart broken but a few times in my life so badly. He said, I don't have anybody else. If you don't go, she'll die. Now, 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 we need God, but there are times when God needs us that if you don't do a certain thing, it won't get done. If you don't talk to a certain person, they'll go to hell. And that is responsibility that God gives to you or to me. When God said he didn't have anybody else, I, I said, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I went and saw the mayor of the city and, 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 went and, and he recommended me to Billy Bid Prison to the head doctor. And I went to see the head doctor and I went to see that little girl. And before 125 witnesses that were made up of police chiefs, uh, heads of departments in the fire department and, 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 uh, and all forms of government, the, the University of the Far East across the street, uh, psychologists and psychiatrists, uh, and, and all the, newspaper, the news, newspaper people, uh, he told everybody. He spent a whole day telling everybody when he found out that I would come. And so before 125 witnesses, we prayed over this little girl and God set her free. If you were to see a little animal become a human, you'd know what happened. This poor little thing, her mother was a spiritist and held seances before she died. She died when the girl was 12. The girl had no more family, so she became a harlot. And now she was 17 years old. She had drifted from town to town in, in harlotry and was so abused <clears throat> and so hurt. She tried to pick up an undercover policeman about 2 o'clock in the morning and landed up in jail. 24 hours after that, she was bitten by these spirits. It, it came right up from her, her family through her. Her mother was a spiritist, and so uh, she was right in line for this type of thing. And, but it was so bad, and the doctors, being trained in the greatest universities in the United States, uh, well, you know, they wanted to write about it, and they wanted to know about it. And, and in a few days' time, they had three they had 3,000 cables, cablegrams, mostly from Japan and, and Taiwan and, and from India and from heathen countries and not from, the, not from Christian lands. Uh, but when we set that girl free, uh, something happened. The Philippines had never had a great revival in its history. It, until 300 years ago, it had had paganism. And then uh, the Roman Catholic Church was there for the 300 years. And, and then when the, uh, the Admiral Dewey came and he, he threw out the Spaniards, and then the, the Americans came and they asked for help because only 15% of the people could read and write, and so the, most of the Methodists went. And, and they were down to our time without a, any great move of the Spirit of any kind. And they had been taught about Christ by the Catholics and they had been taught about education by the Methodists, but they had never had a great revival of changing hearts, you know, by the power of God. And when the mayor of the city saw what had happened. He was so overwhelmed with joy and, and thanks. He had been to see the girl. He saw it with his own eyes. She, she could whip six doctors at one time. I mean, this thing was more terrible than you'll ever be able to imagine without seeing it, you see. And so uh, when, when, when she was free, and he knew she was free by calling the, well, the, the doctor was with me when he said she was free. Then, then the, the mayor said, I can have anything I wanted. And I said, let me go in the front of the city hall here. And, and have open air meetings, and I did. And in front of that city hall, in one crusade of six weeks' time, 150,000 people came to Jesus. The whole nation of the Philippines was moved by God's power from one end to the other end. I went on daily radio on a 50,000 watt station and told them what happened the night before, the number that got saved, the number that found Christ, the number that were healed, and the whole wonderful story until they came from island, island, island to island, and all over the place they came and they found God in the great city of Manila because one girl got an evil spirit cast out of her. I have, I have, I have faith to believe, <laughs> I have faith to believe 
that we're coming into a moment, a most dramatic and heavenly and, and wonderful moment when we're going to set people free and it's going to set the whole world aflame with the power of God. Seek the power of God. Know the power of God. You don't have to be boastful. You don't have to be arrogant. When you meet a need, just say, in Jesus' name, I come against you.